with the discussions on uh, what we discussed this month during committee time. So the first, uh, Eighth grade uh, girls basketball team. Is my mic not here? Can you hear me now? <laughs> uh, just want to congratulate the uh, the middle school eighth grade girls. I had the opportunity to go catch uh, the last game. Uh, my daughter was on a team, and uh, you know, they fared pretty well this season under the COVID conditions. But uh, probably, I just want to say, you know, we we got a phenomenal coaching staff, and something I bore witness. Uh, with, with Mr. Teeter, Mr. Iverson, with those girls, you know, we're losing some some pretty significant girls in eighth grade that are that are going on elsewhere, uh, you know, for for their for their academic and uh, sports careers. But uh, it's nice to see the the camaraderie, um, you know, what he did to uh, just bring those girls together. Um, you know, he left himself pretty vulnerable at the end of that, and it was just it was nice to see that. You know, our girls are in some good hands, at least at the, the middle school level. So just wanted to say that publicly. Thank you. They lost one game. Yeah. Okay. Um, good, Mr. Swicky? Yes. Okay. Uh, next is Education Committee. Um, Mr. Hickey's not here. I, I guess you'll be taking over, Ms. Training. Yeah. Okay, please. 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 The Education Committee met on March 9th. In addition to motions listed on the agenda and a number of other topics, <coughs> we had a conversation about the next phase of the school reopening plan regarding bringing the students back to school full time. The principals have been meeting with their staff this week to ensure that any concerns are taken care of prior to transference to a full day schedule. A majority of the meeting was devoted to the Barnegat High School Data Coach Action Plan presentation, which you will see tonight during the superintendent's remarks. 
To provide a brief overview, the presentation is mainly about the ways in which the Barnegat High School team will be using data during the remainder of the school year to help struggling students by identifying specific areas of need and linking those needs to various interventions and supports. The highlights of the presentations were multiple points of data have been reviewed for every student in grade nine through 12. To provide appropriate context, data was compiled from last year as well as this year to use for comparison. The data coach has identified at-risk students and is in the process of writing a comprehensive plan of interventions, which is individualized for each student. There are three tiers of inter interventions, which will be described in the presentation. Also, the administration feels that this plan will be helpful for identifying the areas of concern in the curriculum and then reinforcing those specific skills. The plan offers a boot camp, an after school session, and also a Saturday session. Saturday has an A session and a B session. The role of the data coach will be to monitor the growth patterns of the students to see if the interventions are working. Another topic of conversation at the Education Committee this month was an update on the District Evaluation Advisory Committee, or DF. This committee provides a forum for staff to give feedback to the administration on evaluation practices such as teacher observations or student growth objectives. The minutes from the DF meeting on February 23rd showed that the staff had a productive conversation on these issues. Thank you. Great update. Thank you. Um, we are going to change the agenda a little bit uh, to have the uh, data coach action plan presentation now instead of during the president's remarks or uh, superintendent's remarks. Uh, so if you'd like to just come to the podium, we can start that. Good evening, everyone, and thank you again for having us out. Um, it was a pleasure to be in front of you the other day uh, discussing the intervention programs that we're putting in place at Barnegat High School. Uh, with me tonight, I have uh, Mr. Frank Vanula, Vice Principal, Mrs. Tracy Dubeck, Vice Principal, and Mrs. Brittany Lyons, uh, Data Coach for Barnegat High School. Uh, what we discussed in our meeting uh, was our tiered approach, what we're looking at uh, for Barnegat High School. Um, starting with identifying problems in students grade nine through 12 and targeting areas in both ELA and mathematics. Through IXL, which is an intervention program and ALEC, another intervention program, software programs that we have been using throughout the district for the last few years, uh, we will look at benchmark scores from 2019-20 and from the 2021 school year and compare them. Uh, we're also looking at remediation uh, and that remediation happens as was described earlier in various different ways. So we're looking at the 1140 to 140 after student dismissal time. We're looking after school from the 140 to 240 time. And we're also looking from Saturdays and keeping students uh, in here on Saturdays for a three hour span, but in splitting that into two sessions for you know, maximizing potential. So if with two sessions, if you're struggling in both ELA and mathematics, there's an opportunity for a student to come in and receive remediation in both. All right, so who is targeted and how are they targeted? Um, so we are looking at obviously academics. Um, we, we showed some of the indicators that we'd be looking at. We're also looking at behavioral and emotional. Um, this is another big thing that we discussed in our meeting is aside from the COVID slide, aside from the academics that we've seen, we're also talking about students that have been isolated one way or another for a good part of a year. And so it's very important that they're also receiving emotional support. And this is where our guidance and child study teams come into play. We can also utilize that time from 1140 to 140 for that staff to be meeting individually with students or in small groups. Um, students experience a COVID slide. Again, we'll have those three intervention timeframes. Looking at our ELA numbers. So we want to give you some concrete numbers that we have identified. Uh, we've gone through and after doing comparison, um, and we've even adjusted these numbers since our initial meeting. So again, we, we continue to refine. These numbers are live. They will continue to change. We will continue to look for progress updates and continue to look for markers. So if you're looking at our tier two, which is our, you know, we're looking about an increase, uh, an inverted funnel. So 
So our tier one is gonna always be our, our largest category. Our tier one is in-classroom supports, in-classroom needs and interventions that our teachers are providing. But when we talk about tier two, now you're getting into where we're utilizing those software programs so that we'll adapt and target specific uh, skills for students. That is our second largest category. And as you go through, you can see in ninth grade, uh, our ELA numbers 56, 69, 98, and 33, and 12, a total of 256 students. Uh, we match that with tier three. You'll see those numbers go down, but these are students that have specific academic needs. Now we're looking for tier three at their classroom performance. So not only are we seeing skill deficits maybe where they're a little bit behind uh, on <coughs> identified priority standards, but we're also looking in the classroom when we're seeing low achievement, we're seeing scores of 50, we're seeing failing scores, we're seeing 65. So not only are they struggling with their skills and, and, and deficits of, of their foundational skills, but they're, cur they're currently struggling with the current content in the classroom. So a tier three difference is now we can provide that actual instructor, that, that certified teacher in the classroom to provide one-on-one -on -one or small group instruction in the library after school. Our math numbers mirror pretty much the same. You can see ninth grade, 80, 10th grade, 119, 120, and 25 students in our 12th grade. And as you take it to tier three for those same grade levels, you see that again, they're smaller, but these are students that are more identified as having academic needs specific to their classes. Uh, Brittany's gonna step up here real quick and talk about the standards that we identified as our priority standards or that were identified for us. So we based our standards off of our benchmarks and um, we decided as a group between the supervisors and the curriculum and the staff here that um, these were the most at risk needed uh, standards that helped to build up the other standards as well. So not only are the students going to be working on rebuilding this foundation, but also they can further where they're going to the next year. And if you see on the, um, on the next slide, it'll show you the exact standard and kind of what it does. Each standard does have multiple parts. So it's not like one part is being taught per day. It does take time to teach and reteach each standard. Uh, the students will have specific uh, growth markers that they're gonna be working with. Um, and then test it on to see how they're doing as they progress through these um, standards. And then we'll hopefully see the results in the benchmarks and in um, their passing class as, as well. So we um, established different standards for the ELA, each group, uh, English 1, English 2, and English 3. And then we've also done the same thing for math. So there's different standards for Algebra 1, Geometry, and Algebra 2. We need you to go into it. Well, I just don't have the okay. <laughs> uh, I don't have All right, so um, I'm going to be talking about how we're going to structure the intervention. Um, specifically, you know, right now we're working with a half-day schedule, and the intervention would basically lie in the period of time that exists between when the kids let out at 11.40, and the two o'clock time period that the teachers leave. So in that time period, we're gonna be using the online programs that we have available with the licenses to provide interventions for the kids and to monitor and track where we should be heading with them. Um, <clears throat> from there, after school, we're gonna be running the program for about an hour so that the kids can get on the late bus. That program is going to be an extension of what exists, however, the big difference between what occurs between 11.40 and two o'clock is that at two o'clock, we now have teachers in those, in those priority standard areas providing additional instruction tailored to those students that stay after, okay? Um, the big change is when we go to a full day. When we go to a full day schedule, we're gonna be embedding in the school day a 23 to 24 minute period at the end of each of the four block periods where a teacher is specifically going to be in instructing and providing interventions or enrichment in the content areas that have been identified. So for English, you know, it would be the, the priority standards and they would just be working on that on a two and a half week rotating schedule, okay, to address those standards. Um, the after school intervention would still be the same of, as what we have for the half day period that we're running right now. Um, the Saturday intervention is where we really, you know, um, provide extra, you know, resources for the students. We would have guidance counselors on hand 
to address the social and emotional needs. They'll be having those conversations. Um, there will be an administrator to also, you know, build rapport with those kids. Um, and additionally, uh, the data coach will be there taking real-time information and addressing those students' needs and updating their plans as they go. Okay? So the schedule that you see there is uh, the schedule that we will be following. Um, it, it counts for what we would call uh, a unit lunch. So that means that everybody is eating lunch at the same time. Um, to highlight just some of the advantages that this is gonna provide for us and the reason that we decided to go with this model. Frank already alluded to the fact that we're putting those interventions inside of every single class period. So if you're in history class, if you're in science class, you have 23 minutes built into that extra period. So you're, you're extending that period for an either a, a remediation or an enrichment in that classroom. So there's no, you don't have to go to a different teacher. You don't have to stay after school. It's built into that period. Two with one lunch period. It, you know, typically we'd be looking at putting 250 to 300 kids in our cafeteria in three different shifts, right? We'd rotate through three lunches. Going through this model, since there's no classes happening when everybody breaks for lunch at the same time, we can use all those additional spaces. We can use our gym. We can use our gym too. We can use our auditorium. We can use our library. We can use our cafeteria, the tents that are gonna be outside for all of our events in May. We can use tents. We can use our courtyard one. We can use our courtyard two. So by spreading everybody out, we now anticipate having 75 to 100 students per location versus 300 kids shoved in one location. A much more manageable number. And while we have to take our masks off, obviously, to eat. It's gonna allow us to be much safer in doing so. We also don't have to worry about the sanitization between lunch periods, right? So if we're running free lunches, you're worried about somebody coming in with a fogger, trying to you know, have the, every table cleaned and dried within four minutes. But since we're not doing that, it's simply one lunch session, everybody breaks from lunch, and then we go back and finish our periods three, four hours throughout the day. It also lines up very nicely with our students from the vocational school and following this model that we get them back into the classroom. A lot of our vocational schools, have, uh, students have been participating virtually for at least block three in a day because they're still on the bus coming back from uh, vocational school. So this gets them to be back in the classroom. They get extra seat time as well. Uh, oh, we jumped a lot there. Our timeline. Um, and so this is something that we, we continue to refine and I wanna update you even since our meeting of, of where we are and what we've been doing. So obviously through March uh, 12th, we were sitting there very diligently trying to identify students. We have identified the students. We have placed them in tiers one, two, and three. Letters are currently right now being mailed out. They will be mailed out this week, identifying to parents and students, hey, you are being offered the opportunity to come on Saturday. You are being offered the opportunity to come during the week and stay after school. You are identified as a tier two in ELA or mathematics. So those letters are being prepared as we speak and should be mailed out either tomorrow or the following day for students to receive. We have been making announcements already. So we have had students staying after school utilizing that 1140 to 140 time already to get caught up on work. We made clear to our teachers through our, our internal meetings and then also through announcements that we are inviting students to be able to stay and be able to participate and get caught up in work. Our substitutes have been that follow through the day um, are staying from 1140. We break them and do the shift lunches, but there is somebody in there with them at all times. So if they have questions about logins or if they have you know, problems, um, they're still substitute are building substitutes that they're used to seeing every single day. Um, and it's been a, a good experience so far. We hope to continue to see those numbers grow. Um, we would love to see more and more students participating. And, and I invite families, uh, you know, if you're hearing this, um, please, you know, if your, your student feels like they didn't have the seat time or didn't have uh, enough one-on-one -on -one instruction, please, right now is the time for them to get involved, to join either our 11 to 140 program, or if you get a letter from us inviting them to our Saturday program or to our after-school program to 240, please, please try, uh, you know, participate in that. The next milestone will be obviously uh, when we get to the 26th, when we get to that breaking point of coming back full day, we will end our boot camp at that point. So that 1140 period would go away, but in place of that, that's where we get that benefit of that 23 or 24 minutes in every single class put back in as an intervention period. So it's a trade-off. Uh, right now we're making the best of the half day situation. And when we go to a full day situation, we want to be prepared to do the same. Um, so our steps for our flow for our district um, data coach coordinator uh, interventions, what we did is we set up a schedule of the priority standards so that classroom teachers know what to focus on every single week. It's not a, a guessing game. We talked about this, so, you know, there's not that other standards aren't important. It's just that we know that in, in our core subject areas, there are 
priority standards that we need to focus on. And these are our measuring sticks. We get to know at the end of this, did we make an improvement by if we see an important performance gain on these individual standards? So by mapping it out, we have a clear map of when the, we're gonna be reviewing these, when we're gonna be working with students on these standards. Here we have outlined the roles of the data coach and the master teacher. Uh, had some wonderful conversations today with our master teacher. And this, this is what this time is in terms of, uh, you know, the master teacher coming to us and saying, okay, I got the data now. What are we gonna make that, that last period, those 23 minutes? How are we gonna structure it? How can I help teachers to best attack those standards? What are the goals and activities? And that's, so that's the key conversations that are happening right now in preparation of us already getting to that, that point when we get to the 26th and go full time. So when we get there, teachers will know expect what's expected. Students are gonna know what's expected and it doesn't just become another, you know, hand out more worksheets. Um, listen, I have to uh, take a break right now because, it, you know, I do not want the perception ever to be that the teachers of Barnegat High School are not exceptional teachers, that they're not doing a great thing every single day. They are. And I, I honestly feel like maybe the message because we're coming so hard now, it's a, it's a new kind of line of, we're looking at data in a new way and we're looking to and make improvements. But that reflection doesn't mean that the students or the teachers of Barnegat High School are not up to par, are not working hard, are not doing everything they can. Things change. You know, Polaroid cameras used to be the best way to take a picture. We took it instantly. Now we use digital cameras, things change. We are looking at the standards and the data in a new way. Maybe it's a better way to address some of the student gaps that we have. Some of this is prompted by COVID, but a lot of this has been a long time in the making. But it does not for a second indicate that our teachers and our students aren't working hard every single day. I just wanted to make that clear. Um, and finally, measuring our progress. You know, We will be looking at our third quarter and fourth quarter benchmarks. We'll be looking at student marking periods and also uh, mark period grades and also our progress indicators along the way. It doesn't end here. So as we hope to see growth through the third and fourth marking periods, we also know that we missed almost a full year of school for some of these students. And we know that summer is gonna be exceptionally important too. And so if we can offer summer school and summer enrichment opportunities, that is something we're engaging in talks right now um, because we know that these students are still gonna have gaps and we need to continue to build them and strengthen them and put them in the best position so that when they move on next year, to whether it be from algebra one to algebra two, or if it means moving from a senior to their freshman year in college, they are in the best position that they can be in to find success. Um, to close this up, Mrs. Dubeck. To echo what Mr. McGee said, basically the great thing about this plan is we have this, this intervention plan that's very specific. And as Mr. McGee said, we have wonderful students. We have amazing teachers. There's this whole group of people in this building now that have a very specific plan to work together holistically. Uh, we, as said, guidance and counselors are going to be working with social and emotional pieces. We have the specific data that's gonna help us with the academic pieces. We have different levels of interventions based on different levels of students need. And what happens now is you see this whole amazing building come together and be able to implement these things together to really support our students, to support our teachers, and to support the high school. Thank you. Any questions for the high school? Then? Mr. McGee. Yeah. Um, how, how long, and I'm, I'm sorry, I, my computer is down today, so I can't see the, uh, and I can't see the board up there uh, okay. on the angle. Typical block, what's the time for a typical uh, class block out of the four periods? So right now we're operating about 60 minute blocks. Um, typically when we go to the full day schedule, we'll be looking at about an 84, 83 minute block. There's a one minute variance because of passing. Gotcha. So, so when we say we're putting the 20 minutes on, the the goal is really for consistency, right? We want cons you know, we don't want to keep changing everything and keep moving the, the mile marker too for both students and for teachers. So they've been planning 60 minute units of instruction. Students have been sitting through 60 minute units of instruction. So that doesn't change. So when we're looking at the 84 minute block, the first 60 minutes is gonna be their instructional period. And then on the following end of that is then when our students that are ready to excel and move on to new enriching materials, we'll move on. And our students that are needing remedial skills in the classroom are targeted. We'll also get those remedial supports. We're hoping to adopt more of a center model, more of a rotation model, small group learning where they can 
you know, be paired in groupings of where they are similarly deficient in similar skills, and then work on remediating those skills or working on enrichment projects at the same time. I got it. Thank you, because that, that was one of my concerns. If it was a 60 minute, you're taking 24 off of there, then, you know, it's 30 minutes. So it essentially, no, sir, yeah. it essentially stays the same. So it's really no change for the teachers. As far as the buy-in from the staff, I mean, are you, people are supporting, you know, a lot of questions, support, a lot, a lot of questions, yeah, obviously. To be honest, so we, we went through three different uh, meetings. So the first meeting I had was our pandemic response uh, team. Um, the state mandated that when we came back to school and when we did our phase one reopening, we had that meeting in, in my building. Um, I reconvened the meeting because we're talking about a phase three reopening. So that's where I initially put it out. Uh, we've also had uh, administrative meetings, clearly, you know, to put uh, some structure together. And, I, and look, I can say again publicly, like, these are not all our ideas. You know, uh, for example, a great example um, that I gave before was um, when we were talking about lunches, even in the presentation, you'll see that it was broken down by location and by grade, right? So sophomores went here, juniors went there, seniors went here. And it was one of the recommendations, uh, actually Mr. Junker said, hey, why don't we, since they're coming out of their period two block, we're gonna have to do seating charts for contact tracing. Why don't we just keep them in their, their period two classes and say upper A hallway dismissed, you're going down to courtyard A. And uh, lower A wing, you're going to courtyard B. And that way, when if we do run into a situation where we have to identify, we already have class rosters made up. We already know who those students are around. Um, so look, it's a very collaborative approach. And then finally today, we had a, what we call a transition team meeting here at the high school, um, where we broke into different groups. And uh, after the main meeting where we discussed some larger concerns, we started breaking into group, one group looking at cafeteria, one group looking at classroom instruction, another group looking at the hallways. You know, to, to bring to a point another conversation piece we had today, we were talking about, we have the orange arrows in the hallways, right? One way hallways. And we had this, we saw this when we walked around the building, you know, it was a recommendation from the state. We didn't know what we were expecting when we came in September, but a lot of the teachers are questioning now, hey, look, is that a practical, is that really helping us to prevent the spread? I mean, we're out in the hallway, we're all breathing. Is it more practical for us to get where we're going quickly and not be you know, congregating in a hallway? So staying to the right, just a simple, like what we all do on the roads, right? Stay to the right and go, go to where you're going and let's get there quickly instead of having these long passing times or even the staggering, right? So we, have, again, this is where multiple viewpoints come in. We have some faculty members that have been other school districts that have tried other approaches where they did like delayed five minutes, sophomores and freshmen, five minutes, uh, juniors and seniors. The problem is that causes a delay. So now some students are lingering in the hallway. They're waiting for their friends to come out, next group. Now you got kids in the hallway for 10 minutes. And to your point, you lost 10 minutes of instruction, right? Five minutes on both ends. So we're, it's absolutely a collaborative approach, buying, getting teachers buy-in, hearing their voices, hearing their concerns, and then making a plan that's gonna work for everybody. Thank you. Any other questions for Ms. McGee? Yes. Um, hi. Um, I just have a question. Are, how many students are identified right now or, or they're not identified? Do we know? Uh, when you say identified, I just wanna be clear. We're not talking about identified, identified special ed. We're talking about identified as- As going to, this, to the, the program. Um, program. Yeah. So we told so we, it on the bottom of the sheets. Do you wanna bring up that slide again? It was hard to see on I don't the know slide. If there. Yeah, no, no problem. There's, I think one of the slides actually broke down how many kids in tier two. Yeah, so in mathematics, um, in ELA, I can tell you ELA tier two, we're looking at 256 students. Okay. In tier three, we're looking in ELA at 154. Our mathematic numbers, tier two is 344 students and tier three is 151. Okay, so they're um, they're mandated to go there, or they are if, not. We cannot mandate that they come after school. Okay, so um, it's more of a volunteer. Like we know invitation. who they are. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're we're absolutely inviting them to come. That's why I said, you know, if you're hearing this at home, please, we invite you. If your student, if you feel like your student is struggling, if you feel like they need some enrichment activities, if you feel like they just missed out on opportunities, uh, we're inviting them to please come from 140 to 240 every day. We do have the late buses that run at 240. On Saturdays, we're running the two sessions from 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. so that they, they have an opportunity there. Um, math, English, science certified teachers will be there. Um, where we can get into structuring it for kids and making sure that they're there is when we go to the full day and we have those 23, 24 minutes in, they'll be in class. There's nowhere else for them to go. So they're gonna get, they're gonna get you know, some remediation there regardless. Uh, but those other opportunities are what we're trying to provide through these programs here. So they can go during the week and Saturdays or it's either Absolutely. or? They can, do, they can do it all. They, they could come from 1140 to 240 every single day, Monday through Thursday, and then come on, on Saturday, Saturday for too. three hours. I'd love to have them. 
Okay, great. Sounds like I, I'm sure if you guys would support too, if I got to come back to you and ask for more staff so we can provide more uh, enriching opportunities, you know, I'd love I'd love to be in that situation. Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. The children that don't participate in, in the if it's not mandated, is are those members gonna be set aside and like, what do we do for them? Yeah, I mean, look, we're going to continue to provide opportunities, and that's why I said I think even as we look into the summer, um, uh, look, I'm not so naive to, to say that, you know, even if you're a student athlete that feel like you missed out on opportunities, it's not going to be practical right now for you to stay after school every day, right? When we get into sports and, and you're, you have practice, now I'm making you choose between a sport that you love and a passion and, and coming. So you may not get all those weekday opportunities, but you could take advantage of the Saturday opportunities, which is why we try to offer so many different diverse opportunities but carrying that over to the summer. And I, I don't think this is something we're gonna let go of in September. I think in September, we're gonna be very much talking about where our students are, what students didn't get caught up, those students that maybe didn't participate for whatever reason and, and getting them caught up. So the summer would be mandated at that point, right? We, uh, so I can, yeah, I can touch upon summer. So we started uh, 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 kicking off our summer plans for enrichment and remedial. Um, so I know next month we're going to plan to do a, a brief presentation on that during the committees the whole time. Uh, we're going to ask to do that during the committees the whole time, and we're going to present it during that committee. But um, essentially, you still can't mandate that kids come. But what you're ho what we're hoping for is provide enough incentives for them to come. So when you look at like the elementary, the K to six band. Uh, we're looking at doing different types of enrichment activities throughout the summer and students that come uh, uh, from like, you know, let's say 90 to 100 percent attendance during that four weeks uh, will get 20 raffle tickets and they'll get an entry pass to a fair that we're looking to uh, put on school grounds uh, towards the end of August, uh, like bouncy houses, things like that. So something that the kids will want to participate in. And then what we're currently working on right now is, uh, is, uh, is getting uh, 50 Kindle uh, uh, Kindles for uh, for students. Uh, that would be raffled off during that period of time. So students would have an incentive to come and participate in those enrichment activities uh, throughout the summer uh, with the mindset that they would get uh, and they would gain entrance to this, uh, this fun opportunity at the end of the summer. And then they would also get an opportunity for the more raffle tickets that they have to have the uh, opportunity to maybe win something uh, while they come to that event. And then for the seven through 12, we're also looking to mirror that. We're looking to do enrichment activity and we're also looking to do remedial. So in middle school and high school, we run remedial summer school for students that don't pass a class. Um, if that's the case, again, it's not mandatory that they go, but obviously if you're failing a class and you go make it up over the summer, you're not repeating the class for an entire school year. Um, so that's usually why we get, you know, the students that do fail um, a class or two classes uh, do try to take advantage of coming to that remedial summer. Um, but we're also gonna offer it as an enrichment uh, opportunity for all the students for the first time. And we're gonna take that same model so again, if you come, you'll uh, you'll get raffle tickets to potentially win uh, win something when you come to that uh, come to the I'm calling it a fair for lack of a better word, but essentially we're trying to we're trying to have something exciting with fancy houses and food trucks and things like that. We're going to try to to navigate putting that together. Um, so you'll get you'll gain entrance by participating in this, and then you'll also gain um, the opportunity to win something through a raffle. So we're we're really looking in, uh, to try to you know incentivize the kids to come out and be a part of this, and then for parents that. Um, you know, might normally maybe send their child to a camp. One of the things that I have Mr. Nickel working on right now is through our uh, right at school provider where they would maybe provide something in the afternoon. So a parent that might, be, might need like a full day for their child to go because they work, their child can come to the enrichment camp for free in the morning and then hopefully take advantage of this uh, right at school in the afternoon for, you know, a smaller fee. Um, you know, obviously far cheaper than they would probably pay for full day, you know, you know, take going to a camp or something like that. So we are looking uh, at this point, um, we're, we're, we're chasing down all the little details of this so that we can have it all in place. And then hopefully we'd like to put out those flyers in April. Um, you know, to Pat's point about getting participation here, a big part of this is gonna be that parent piece. So it's gonna be more than just sending out a letter to the home, it's gonna be taking that opportunity to call each one of those parents, explain why their child was identified um, as needing some help or some remediation, no different than we do at the elementaries. Uh, when a student gets selected for RTI, they get a letter, but they, they hopefully also get that follow-up phone call to kind of communicate and partner with the parent. So the hope is that if, you know, as a parent, you hear that, you know, your son or daughter is struggling in a specific area and they have this opportunity, they'll have this opportunity to, to make up that work. And one of the unique opportunities here as well is, let's say you really struggled for the first two marking periods um, for whatever reason, this additional time on Saturdays, this additional time after school, things like that would provide you that opportunity to potentially make up some of that lost uh, 
time or maybe failing grades that you had in the first two marking periods. So you might be able to potentially make up that work so that you don't have to go to summer school um, and you have the choice to go for enrichment summer school, you know? So, uh, you know, they are trying, I know the high school team has been, has really been trying to exhaust um, everything, putting this up to, up to, you know, um, getting this up and running. And I applaud all you guys, you know, how much work went into from the last, we only, it was only three weeks since the last board meeting to now. And all this was put together and students were identified. And I know those letters I believe are going out tomorrow. And I, I imagine those phone calls will be starting tomorrow as well um, with the hope to try to get students uh, locked into this program and to try to get that extra help. So I hope that answers your question. It's pretty long winded. I, I took a few laps around the track on that one, sorry. <laughs> but great job to you guys. I mean, this is really a testament. You guys really worked very hard. I have yeah. a question. Yeah. That Saturday session, will transportation, transportation be provided or yes. we have to? Yep. Oh, nice. absolutely. We, I know we reached out to Ms. Vargas. Uh, we'll have to obviously, you know, pay a couple drivers coming over time to work on that. But we felt that we didn't want to have any roadblocks from students being able to participate. So we will Great. be providing That's transportation. Awesome. Dr. Lamas, um, the summer program. Yes. Um, there was a comment made to me that for the life of me, I can't remember where it was. Do we provide? I can't hear um, you, George. Sorry. I'm trying. Better? <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Much. Uh, do we provide our own internal summer program? Uh, there was a comment made to me that uh, we kind of share services or we, we send folks over to Southern. That That's where they would go for their their summer school. And I, no, we uh, I, ever since I've been here, I know I, I maybe historically at some point that might have been something we've done. I know since I've been here, we've always we've uh, we've done our own right. summer school. It's 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 looked very different, uh, different summers. I know one summer the uh, the mindset was to just try to make it all like everybody gets an Apex account and then, you know, on their own. Um, and we saw that pretty much almost every kid failed in summer school. So then we pivoted away from that and we started having the kids come in. And even though they had a blended model with staff overseeing them work on their virtual and that was successful. This this summer now is a return to uh, the traditional model, trying to get everybody in to actually like have that more classroom teacher experience. No, I appreciate it. Yep. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. McGinn, team. That was a Thank good you. presentation. Thank Look you. forward to seeing positive results. Uh, next up is the Edwards Committee. And uh, the Edwards Committee met on March 8th. We included some longtime staff and four former board members to get a history of what's been done with the Edwards School over the past few years. Uh, we discussed the many potential outcomes from selling, leasing, rehabbing, and uh, using for educational facilities. Uh, and I'd just like to take time to thank the former board members and staff members who participated in the meeting. It was, uh, it was insightful. So we, we did find out that the title is clear. There's no limitations on the use. Um, we had an assessment done to the building conditions in 2017. Uh, that'll, be, that'll have to be updated to take in any of the changes that have happened since then. Uh, various stakeholders have met um, with organizations over the years to, to see who has an interest. Uh, colleges, hospitals, trade groups, ROTC, athletics. We want to look into all the potential opportunities that we could to use the school. And the, the goal is to open the discussion to the community when we have enough information to present. So I, I want to make sure that we have what the financial requirements are, what the opportunities are, and, and have all of that information available to present to you. Um, that was Edwards Committee. Does anybody have any questions on the Edwards School? Okay. Ms. Continenza, governance? Thank you, Mr. President. Um, governance committee met on March 10th. Um, motions one, two, and three are second readings of policies and regulations. Motion four is additional state policies that were reviewed by the committee. Motion five is policy 5311, it's return to school post illness. This is a policy provided to us from Strauss Esme. At the beginning of the school year, parents are given a note from the school nurse which contains this information. However, we wanted to have an actual policy specifically with the items listed so that all schools in our district are consistent. Um, motion six is to revise the school calendar. Um, the full PD day was changed from April 26th to April 19th. Um, the delayed opening was changed to no delay opening on May 12th. The staff will have a PM PD instead. And that's it. Thank you. Any questions? Governor's questions? I got one for uh, Dr. Lamas. <laughs> We got a ton of questions tonight. Uh, <laughs> the security guards uh, that we use, the armed the arm guards, are they under the uh, uh, class three title or are they privatized? 
Yeah, no, they're not. Uh, they're not class three. They're uh, privatized. They are privatized. Okay, so the the whole uh, marijuana change just wouldn't affect them. They would still be able to go about their business as opposed to where the SROs hands are kind of tied. Correct. Yes, the SRO's hands are definitely tied uh, in, in that. Um, however, uh, typically when, uh, if there's going to be substance, uh, and even with the marijuana uh, laws changing, it's still uh, an illegal substance for somebody under the age of 21. So it would be treated no different than if we saw a student on premise with alcohol or, or tobacco or one of these other um, illegal substances for them. Uh, administration usually uh, takes the lead on that. Um, even historically, uh, that was always something that the administration, it's a, it's a funny thing with schools where schools in, in some cases actually have a lot more authority and a lot more um, the ability to pursue things that law enforcement is still kind of bound to, to their you know, code. So um, those things would typically um, be handled by administration where you would, you know, you might see a change is uh, I know as part of that new legislation, uh, there's a component where uh, uh, police are not allowed to inform the parents. They, they are not, a, that's, you know, that's a no-no. So in that situation, if you uh, go into the high school and you see, uh, you know, our SRO running away from a main office, it's probably because the administration's making the phone call and he doesn't want to be anywhere near it. So that's where the, you'll see the biggest change. I, I just asked because the whole clause in there about the, uh, you know, potential liability for violating so many civil rights. I don't want to see one of our staff get Quite under, you know. Yeah, hundred percent. That's all. Yep. Appreciate it. Any other governance questions? Good. Good. Uh, Mr. Walsh with personnel. Uh, good evening. No, your mic's not on. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, personnel. Not too much to talk about tonight. Uh, we're approving three employees. We are, we are approving three employees to work with Strengthening Families Program. Um, they work with families to work on parenting skills, youth skill training. Uh, these skills include communication, problem solving, anger management, coping skills, and maintaining a whole family. Uh, there also is a retirement this month. Uh, Mr. Peters, he's retiring from the district after 31 years of service. He has been a teacher, guidance counselor, coach, and most importantly, a mentor for all these years. Uh, thank you, Mr. Peters, for everything you've done for our district. Thank you. That's, that's all I have for personnel. Any questions for personnel? Okay. Okay. I think we can, we can adjourn uh, Committee of the Whole and move into uh, the regular Board of Ed meeting. There is a motion to so move. Second. Ms. Bibbins. Yes. Ms. Cherney. <laughs> Ms. Contenanza. Yes. Mr. Fedorzik. Yes. Mr. Quelch. Yes. Mr. Zawicki. Yes. Mr. Sherman. Yes. Mr. O'Brien. Yes. All right. Community of the whole is adjourned at 620. Call to order the regular meeting of the Barnegat Board of Education. The notice, excuse me, the notice of this meeting has been forwarded to the Asbury Park Press, the Beacon, tap into Barnegat and placed in the foyer of each Barnegat Township school in the Barnegat Township Municipal Building and has been, on, has been filed with the Barnegat Township Municipal Clerk in conjunction with the Open Public Meetings Act. I'll do a roll call with... Um, Ms. Bivens? Here. Ms. Cherney? Here. Ms. Contenanza? Here. Mr. Fedorzik? Here. Mr. Hickey? Mr. Quelch? Here. Mr. Zawicki? Here. Mr. Sherman? Here. And Mr. O'Brien? Here. All right. We have a quorum for the regular meeting. Flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Item number five, I'd like to have a motion to approve the agenda or and or additions. I don't think there's any additions. So just so approve the agenda. Second. Ms. Bivens? Yes. Ms. Cherney? Yes. 
Ms. Contenanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorczyk? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. All right, we have an agenda. Item number six is the approval or minutes uh, for the regular session meeting on February 23rd and uh, executive session from February 23rd as well. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Second. Okay. Ms. Bivens? Yes. Ms. Cherney? Yes. Ms. Contenanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorczyk? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. O'Brien? Yes. All right, motions carry. Thank you. Item number seven, I'd like to hear from Kira Smith, the student representative. Hello. So as we move into the spring, we have a lot of exciting events in the works at Barnegat High School. The senior boys have begun practice for the 2021 Mr. Bengal that will take place May 1st outside on the track. The boys have been separated up into groups and given a date, so they're coming in separately. Uh, to work on the routine. We've also started signups for Girls Powder Puff on April 15th, which has received lots of positive feedback, as well as our 2021 Rumble in the Jungle, which will take place that following Friday. Um, both of these events are available for any in-person student. Uh, so far, we've seen lots of students excited to participate in these events, and student government is excited to preserve several of these Barnegat High School traditions that were put on hold, and we're excited to do it safely and as efficiently as possible. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Uh, item number eight, uh, Barnegat Education Association Liaison, Ms. Mayo, are you online? I am, hi, thank you. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien, Board of Education, Dr. Latwis. Just a reminder that we are still taking nominations for the Alumni Staff Hall of Fame. Please go onto the Barnegat Schools website and find the link to nominate an alumni. We'd also like to mention that our president, Chip Junker, was highlighted in the NJEA magazine for initiating the Hall of Fame. We would like to thank all of you for supporting this and Dr. Latwis and Board of Ed, thank you very much and we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mayo. Thank you. Okay. Uh, item number nine, superintendent's remarks. Okay, I'm actually uh, going to give it another minute. I believe Chief Germain is coming in, so I'm going to switch uh, the upstanders. Oh, look at that. <laughs> Timing is everything, Chief Germain. That was awesome. All right, well, then with that being said, we will keep uh, the fidelity of the agenda. And uh, Ms. Perpry, please come on up. Good evening. Um, Barnegat is a place where we believe in a positive school climate, family togetherness, and community involvement. And it is the marriage of these three principles that defines the Upstander Program. Teenage Barnegat is a district this year. We started recognizing students aligned with the Bengal Pride acronym, one letter per month. And the letter for this month is P for perseverance. To reward these students, we're granting them a gift card for a family meal at a local restaurant. And this month is courtesy of Naples Pizzeria to reinforce the idea of a family meal and family togetherness. I'm honored tonight to recognize six upstanding individuals for their commitment to making Barnegat a better place. So when you hear your name, please join Board President, Mr. O'Brien, Chief of Police, Keith Germain, and Superintendent, Dr. Lawis, in celebrating you by coming to receive your plaque and gift certificate. So first we are recognizing senior at BHS, Mr. David Helfrich. David encompasses all of the characteristics of a great student. He is thoughtful, cooperative, responsible, and diligent. He is thriving academically, but those of us who have known him through the years have known that it wasn't always an easy road to get here. David has worked hard to overcome challenges that faced him early in his time. He's grown so much, learning to cope with frustration and appropriately seek support when he's needed. And he's developed into such a mature young man that he is heading off to Rutgers University in the fall. We look forward to hearing of his new adventures and triumphs. Congratulations on all of your hard work and success, David. And next we're recognizing Brackman Upstander winner, eighth grade Olivia Rodenizer. Olivia is the embodiment of perseverance. She reads, finds hobbies, and will reach out to her teachers when she's struggling with her work. 
She has developed into a true student this year, using her resources wisely. In the past, school and good, in the past, school and good grades have not come easily to her. But despite this year's difficulties, COVID, and other responsibilities, Olivia has been steadfast in her studies all year. She's kind to her classmates, always willing to help, and she's becoming more comfortable with all the success that she knows she will receive. Olivia sticks to it until she gets it. Thank you, Olivia. And now we will recognize Mr. Jackson Thomas, fifth grader at Four Bell. It is always so nice to see a student come into their own. Jackson has really grown to become a remarkable student. He has joined so many clubs this year, including, but not limited to, Student Council, Four Bell's Morning Splash, and the Sign Language Club. He is very involved in these clubs and he gives 100% effort. He is kind and he's always willing to help. Jackson's growth this year has really made him an outstanding upstander and we're so proud of him. And next we will recognize third grader at Donahue, Taylor Oyamain. Donahue School has selected Taylor for the March Upstander Award for Perseverance. Taylor is the epitome of a student who demonstrates perseverance and whether she's writing an essay or story, practicing math facts, solving a fraction problem, or working on reading comprehension, she gives it 110%. If something does not become challenging, she does the right thing and she asks questions so she can learn new challenging concepts. Taylor demonstrates her determination through participating in all of the class discussions and lessons. We are so impressed by her optimistic attitude and her impressive work ethic. She is so deserving of this reward. Next, we will recognize first grader at Collins, Gianni Guido. Congratulations to Gianni. Gianni Guido exemplifies the trait of perseverance. He faces each task and challenge with a positive attitude. He gives 100% effort every day and he never quits, even when tasks become difficult. During our virtual days, even when he's having technical issues, he does not give up. If one connection froze, he would join back into our meeting using another device. Now that is perseverance at its finest. Congratulations, Shani. And last but not least, we will be recognizing our pre-K student from Dumpy, Carter Faye Boggs. It doesn't look like Carter's here to join us, but I will read to um, acknowledge him. Carter works hard every day and never gives up. He is a great role model for his peers. Carter focuses on what he is doing and takes his time when doing his work, writing his name, and completing a puzzle, building with blocks, or hanging up his backpack and mask, his in-class responsibilities. He works toward being successful every day. Thank you, students and families. See you next month. <laughs> All right, before I invite uh, Chief Warrant Officer Mackey up for a, uh, the next uh, presentation, just a couple of things that I would like to uh, take a moment to highlight and recognize. Uh, so uh, first thing is I just wanted to give a shout out to some uh, of our incredible staff at Horbell. Uh, we had a, a very scary incident a couple of weeks ago with a uh, student um, that had to go to the hospital. And during the student's uh, um you know, issues at Horbelt, we had a number of staff that jumped right in and uh, supported the student, helped the student, and, uh, you know, really assisted in leading to a positive outcome. So just a quick shout out to uh, security, uh, James Kingston, uh, nurses uh, Brooke Manfredi and Liz uh, Fedro, uh, Fedrovich, uh, Heather uh, Keller, uh, custodian Demetrius uh, Pantlos, and Dr. Saxon, of course. So just a quick shout out to those individuals uh, for jumping into action to help one of our 
students in need. Um, and uh, next, I'd like to just uh, quickly just say a quick shout out to uh, Mr. Uh, E.C. Peters and the congratulations on his retirement. Uh, you know, as was pointed out, he's been in the district uh, for 31. He has 31 years of service. Um, uh, he's been a guidance counselor, a teacher, a uh, coach. Uh, but one of the things that really stands out to me about uh, Mr. Peters is he's the guidance counselor that takes lead, working with a number of other individuals, but he's one of the counselors that takes lead on the uh, scholarship night that we run every year. And uh, to date, that has generated over a million, a million dollars in scholarship money that's gone to various graduating classes, uh, seniors. Um, and that's a really impressive thing. So he has touched the lives of thousands. Uh, he's an incredible individual, and we're definitely going to miss, uh, miss him, but we wish him well in his next endeavor. Um, and with that being said, uh, I would like to invite uh, Chief Warrant Officer James Mackey up. And uh, while we are uh, prepping to um, honor a very, very impressive uh, young lady, uh, what I'd like to also cite is that we recently had an inspection of our ROTC, uh, ROTC program by Commander Miller. Uh, there's seven categories that they look at in an ROTC program that range from administration to academic program to uh, report and record keeping, cadet performance, student mentoring, um, and the overall inspection grade. And uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, we received an above average uh, rating for the program. And I think that's a true testament to the young uh, men and women that are in the program. Um, and I think that's a true testament to uh, the administration, obviously, and the Board of Education that supports uh, the program. Uh, but nobody, I think, has a bigger impact on that than, obviously, uh, Chief Warrant Officer James Mackey. So a very big congratulations to you, sir. You're doing an amazing job running the program, and we couldn't be more thrilled to have you uh, as part of our Barnegat family taking the lead on, on, on running that RS, our junior ROTC program. So uh, with that being said, I would like to invite him up, uh, uh, Chief Warrant uh, Officer James Mackey, uh, to... Uh, introduce and uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, our impressive young lady. I would love nothing more for you to do. Uh, uh, good evening. Uh, let it be noted that uh, March is uh, uh, Women's History Month. And so uh, think of that when, uh, when I read the citation. Uh, I am pleased and honored to be here tonight as the Naval Science Instructor for the Barnegat ROG NJROTC. I am even more thrilled to be here to thank the Barnegat Superintendent, Dr. Latwis, and the Barnegat Board of Education, and the Barnegat High School Administration, Mr. McGee, Mr. Panulo, and Mrs. Dubeck, for taking the time to recognize one of Barnegat's best, Cadet and the, and the Navy Junior ROTC Company Commander, Mary Cordy. Three weeks ago, our unit here at Barnegat High School underwent a very thorough inspection of our Daily Standard Operating Procedures, or SOP. The inspector reviewed our organizational risk management plans and the safety of our cadets. Our cadets were also subjected to verbal testing of their Navy knowledge and the curriculum and program curriculum. And finally, cadets were, uh, were front and center for a formal Navy uniform inspection that was second to none. Why do I mention this? I mention this because of one's leadership. It is because of the core values of the three C, three C services of the United States Navy, Coast Guard, and Marine Corps. Courage, honor, respect, commitment, always being faithful or semper fi, and setting the example for others to follow. We are here tonight because of Cadet Mary Cordy. It was Cadet Cordy, along with her cadet staff and the Corps of Cadets, that made this year's annual inspection such a success. During the inspection, our area manager, Commander Jimmy Miller, awarded Cadet Cordy the Cadet Achievement Ribbon for her performance of each, uh, 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 for her performance of each and every cadet, and her excellent and accurate briefing of the unit's accomplishments despite the COVID pandemic. Cadet Cordy received a very rare honor that is reserved for very few cadets and units each year. And, and that is not me saying this, but it is Commander Miller talking. Citation reads, to Cadet Cordy, quote, awarded when earned to any cadet who distinguishes him or herself by outstanding achievement or sustained superior performance. The cadet must exhibit exceptional military aptitude and dedication to the program, as well as an overall excellence in all facets of NJROCC. Award, awarded on a case-by-case -case basis by the area manager, unquote. 
We are also proud of uh, you, uh, Cadet uh, Cordy. Bravo Zulu, congratulations. Uh, thank you very much, and I'll turn it back over to you. Number 11 is the president's remarks. Uh, so phase three of the reopening plan was communicated last week. Uh, we're going back to four full days of school, which is great news. The district is taking significant precautions to make sure there's room so that the students can be spread out during lunches, and the warm weather will help with this. Virtual options will remain open for students that want to stay virtual, uh, but the big part is everyone must do their part to ensure that we can finish the year with some sense of normalcy. So everybody, um, students, staff, everybody at home has to participate so all these kids can enjoy their proms and every other event that we have planned for the spring. Uh, students who have made the honor roll should have or will be receiving their letters and awards. So I just want to commend everybody. It was great work uh, for the first half of the year. I would make everybody proud. Um, we've been planning, the schools have been planning the end of year events at the high school. Uh, BHS staff and students have been working together to plan the prom, graduation, and other milestone events. I know Mr. McGee and his team want to give our students everything they can, and these kids deserve to have these opportunities. But again, it is critical for all of us uh, to be vigilant so that our students can finish this year strong. Uh, tonight, we are in the first stage of the budget review. We will vote on sending the preliminary budget to the county. Board members will be reviewing all the budget details and communicating more in future Committee of the Whole sessions. And uh, budget impacts and priorities will be made clear to the public as we proceed. And then finally, I'd just like to invite everybody to like and follow the Board of Ed Facebook page. We'll have regular postings like Meet the Board Member, and that'll be the future home of all the upstander profiles and board information and district highlights. Thank you. Um, I'd like to have a motion to enter public session. So moved. Second. Um, Miss uh, Bivens. Yes. Miss Cherney. Yes. Miss Contenanza. Yes. Mr. Fedorzik. Yes. Mr. Quelch. Yes. Mr. Zawicki. Yes. Mr. Sherman. Yes. Mr. O'Brien. Yes. Right. We are in public session. The Barnegat Township Board of Education appreciates and welcomes public comment, advice, and suggestions especially when it is intended to assist the Board of Education. Please feel free to speak to the board during the public session. Comments and discussion will be limited to one five minute period per individual unless requested by the chairperson to continue on a point of clarification. Public comment at special meetings of the board shall be related to the call of the meeting in accordance with board policy. Each participant must be recognized by the presiding officer and must preference their comments by an announcement of their name, address and group affiliation if appropriate. Your anticipated courtesy to the members of the public and the board is appreciated. Doors open. Anybody in the audience like to speak? Uh, President O'Brien. Yes. Uh, Carter just showed up. Oh, okay, good. So we're going to make that the first. We're going to. Uh, okay, if you would like to make that the first public. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, please uh, pause public. Comment. Um, I am so honored to invite Carter Day Bobs to the stage to be recognized as an upstander tonight. Congratulations, sweetheart. You are the representative for Dumpy Pre K um, this month. Carter works hard every single day and he never gives up. He is a great role model for his peers. He focuses on what he's doing and he takes his time when doing his work, writing his name, 
completing a puzzle, building with blocks, or hanging up his backpack and his mask. He works toward being successful every single day. We are so proud to have him as part of our Dumpy family. Congratulations. <laughs> While I have the microphone, I would like to um, acknowledge Mr. Peters for the third time tonight, which is very fitting. Um, I am the supervisor of guidance for the school counselors in the district, and I have had the unique opportunity to know Mr. Peters as a, um, a co-counselor years ago and as the supervisor for the past few years. He has served in education for 39 years, 31 in Barnegat, and for 26 as a school counselor. First, actually in Brackman after serving as a special ed teacher, and um, more recently in DHS for the past few decades. Like Dr. Latwitz said, Mr. Peters has served countless students, and to demonstrate his strong determination to provide the best school counseling to our students in over 1,000 letters of recommendation that have been written, he has never once copied and pasted a sentence. He spends so much time on um, writing personally tailored um, letters of recommendation. We're so honored to work with him and he will be known and so deeply missed personally and professionally for his unparalleled energy and healthy perspective on life. So I just wanted to give him that shout out and congratulations, Mr. Peters and his family. I don't see anybody in the audience comment. Is there anybody online that would like to comment? We have a hand raised. Mr. Junker. Thank you, Mr. O'Brien. William Junker. I am the president of the Barnegat Education Association. Um, first and foremost, again, about Mr. Peters um, and all the educators that have um, retired this year. Um, really, a lot of irreplaceable professionals that we have um, seen, you know, make that transition this year. Um, and I don't think any of them were really ready. I think a lot of things that took place this year have set them in that path. I'm sure when I talk to Mr. Peters next couple of days, he'll, he'll say the same thing that he really wasn't ready to go. Um, but some of the things that are taking place this year have really, um, you know, helped them make that decision. Um, and not to underscore that, but that said, you know, I hear a lot about this phase three plan and, um, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't, I didn't, I didn't talk about the numbers that we actually are seeing in Barnegat right now. Um, at the end of February, I was really positive about going into March and, and um, having cases drop. But I, I want to call you guys to attention some actual real case numbers right now. So when you look at the SARS-CoV-2 cases in Barnegat Township, now we're not talking about the county, just our township from February, February 1st to 16th, that's 1 to 16, there were 138 cases in Barnegat. Comparatively to March right now, we're up to 140. So we actually have two more cases, positive cases in the town of Barnegat um, in March than we did in February. On top of that, if you want to look at our cases in the school, um, we had 26 positive cases to date in February, and we're up to 22 positive cases now in March. Hey, listen, I'm hoping those numbers change for April with us getting outside. Um, I'm, I'm not guessing and saying they are, but I, I want to make sure that everyone is aware of that. And that when we do make a change to go to a phase three, that we are looking closely at our numbers within Barnegat and making our decision based upon those. Um, you know, I, I, I know Dr. Latwis knows better than anybody that I, I'm following these numbers. Uh, I'm doing my best to, to, to have a grip on what's taking place. Um, also educating myself about what's going on and what people are saying and what our doctors are saying. And I, I happen to read a bit about Francis Collins and watch him speak. Um, I don't know if you guys know Francis Collins is. He's the guy who uh, oversaw decoding the human genome. And this just this weekend, he was he was saying to the country, 
hey, you know, we got to hang on and not blow it in the end. Um, he, he made an analogy about not tripping at the 10 yard line. And this really isn't a time to relax. It's not a time to stop running hard toward that goal. And our goal is, is that getting, getting that immunity level and keeping everybody safe and not letting our guard down. And I, I've been preaching that to our staff on the daily. Hey, guys, it's not a time to put our guard down. We've got to keep vigilant. Um, and I hope that our district is doing the same thing and not just making a decision based upon the fact that, like, oh, the numbers are a little bit lower. Um, and, and hopefully they're using that data um, that we're doing in the classroom every day. We're, we're talking about using our data to help our teaching. I hope that we use our data to help that our decisions that we're making for phase three. Um, and, and, I, and I'll say this, like, I agree that we all desperately want to go back. We all desperately want our kids back to a full day. Um, we want to go back to normal. Um, but pushing this issue now, when we're close to some long-term solutions, that maybe we get to a place in September that we can, like, we can have this in our rearview mirror, um, uh, we, we should be doing that. Um, and I'll say this, and, and Dr. Latwis knows how I feel. I think we've done a better job here in Barnegat than a lot of districts. I see the numbers in other districts. And we've done a good job. And we've done a good job because our staff have remained vigilant. We put a lot of things in place. Um, I hate to see our attention, our focus get blurry. Um, and I, I just hope that all of us in this room consider that before we make a, a big push to our phase three plan. Um, that's all I have to say tonight. I hope everyone has a, a safe and happy spring break. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Junker. Does anybody else online have any comment? Um, okay. Does anybody else online have any other comments? Okay. There's a motion to end public session. I'll move. Ms. Bivens. Yes. Ms. Cherney. Yes. Ms. Continanza. Yes. Mr. Podorzik. Yes. Mr. Quelch. Yes. Mr. Zawicki. Yes. Mr. Sherman. Yes. Mr. O'Brien. Yes. All right, we'll close public session at 649. Okay. So motion for item number 13, uh, I'm sorry, uh, motions one through seven. So move. Second. Discussion? Any questions, comments on any of the motions? Okay. All right, um, Ms. Journey. Ms. Continanza, I'm sorry. I skipped one. Hold on a second. I got too excited. Ms. Bivens, I'm sorry. <laughs> Start over. Yes. Okay, Ms. Journey? Yes. Ms. Continanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yeah. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Right. Motions carry. Okay. Um, item number 14, athletic committee motions. Anybody have any questions or comments? Okay, motion to approve. Second. Um, Ms. Bivens? Yes. Ms. Cherney? Yes. Ms. Continanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. O'Brien? Yes. All right. Motions carry. Okay. Uh, item number 15, executive committee motions, one through three. Questions or comments? Is that, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, education. So, sorry. What did I say? Executive. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's got an E. <laughs> Any questions, comments? Okay. Motion to uh, vote, please. So moved. Second. Ms. Bivens. Yes. Ms. Cherney. Yes. Ms. Continanza. Yes. Mr. Fedorzik. Yes. Mr. Quelch. Yes. Mr. Zawicki. Yes. Mr. Sherman. Yes. Mr. O'Brien. Uh, item number. Uh, yes. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, now, item number sixteen: Education Committee for Information Purposes Only, out of district workshops. On to uh, item number 17, governance committee motions, one through six. Any questions or comments? So moved. Second. 
Chapel. Ms. Bivens? Yes. Ms. Journey? Yes. Ms. Continanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. Robaran? Yes. Motions carry. And item number 18, personnel committee motions, one through 18. Any questions or comments? Have a motion, please. So moved. Second. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bivens? Yes. Ms. Cherney? Yes. Ms. Continanza? Yes. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. Mr. O'Brien? Yes. Motions carried. Okay. And item number 19, motion to move into executive session. So moved. Second. Okay. Ms. Bivens? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Cherney? Yes. Yeah. Ms. Continanza? Yes. Yeah. Mr. Fedorzik? Yes. Mr. Quelch? Yes. Mr. Zawicki? Yes. Mr. Sherman? Yes. And Mr. O'Brien? Yes. All right. We're in executive at 6.52. Uh, attendees online will rejoin after executive session is over. Thank you.